Hello, beautiful people. Welcome to this week's episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I'm your host and producer of the show, Olga Peters, and I'm very happy to welcome to the show this week, regular contributor, Emily Kornheiser, who is one of three reps from the town of Brattleboro. Hello, Emily. Hello, Olga, and so nice to be speaking with you in the evening rather than the first thing in the morning. Yes, we should have actually made cocktails tonight. Mm -hmm. We weren't thinking. <laughs> anyway, good to be here with you. Yes, it is. It's lovely. And I want to welcome to the show Representative Seth, Seth Bongartz, who is from Manchester. He represents the Bennington 4 District, which includes Arlington, Manchester, Sandgate, and what looks like on the map, a piece of Sunderland. Part of is Sunderland, that correct? Yeah. Yeah, yes, part of perfect. Yeah. Um, he serves on the House Committee on Environment and Energy, as well as the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules. You may have heard it referred to as LCAR or LICAR. LCAR. Sometimes, LCAR. Um, and this is actually your third stint in the state house you served in the 80s and now you're back now looking for more trouble is that right yeah i uh, was in the in the house as i in my 20s and a little time in the senate in my 30s then married having a child and that was that <laughs> things got busy <laughs> and so now, <laughs> so now now uh you know 30 34 years later i think it is i'm uh it was able to go back and timing worked out and so here i am and I'm now in my uh, in my second term of, of this most recent iteration. Well, welcome back to the State House and welcome to the show, uh, Seth. We are going to talk today about housing. I know we talk about housing a lot, but it's just, I mean, I don't know about either of you, but whenever I am out and about with my reporter hat on and I talk to communities and I'm like, well, what's your challenge? And they're like, housing, housing, housing yeah. housing and housing <laughs> yeah. so uh i don't think we can talk about it too much and you seth are actually working on some housing bills um from a number of different angles i see that there's one a study on strengthening regional plans there's some things on zoning i would love to hear from you like what pieces of the housing puzzle are you trying to to fill in right now with your work well it's worth noting that over the last several years, the last, let's say, three years, we've really done some amazing work on housing, uh, trying to make it easier to build housing. We've put a lot of money into infrastructure to support housing, and actually a lot of money into, of course, building housing itself. And a lot of that is still, of course, in the pipeline. It's going to take a little while for it to come. But we did some we did some things to like make it easier to do uh infill housing in downtowns would relax, uh, at least on a temporary basis, some restrictions, some active victory restrictions, um, or regulations, I shouldn't say restrictions, regulations in order to make it a little easier to build in downtowns. And uh, so I think that, with, so what's going on this year, um, and, we've, and we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars through ARPA funds. And, and when you combine, you know, the, the ability to, uh, for towns to be able to add uh, water and sewer infrastructure, that's of course when housing really becomes that's a key, a key. It's not the only ingredient, but it does certainly make it easier. There's also community systems and other ways, but um, so that really counts too. But we've done a, we've done a lot over the last couple of years, and a lot of that is now beginning. You know, it's in the pipeline, and we're beginning to see the, the results. But it's going to take a little time. But um, so what has happened over as part of the Home Act last year, um, and was that we commissioned three studies and i'm going to get into the weeds a little bit you told me that's okay to be a little weedy mm -hmm. totally um, okay. so. and just wait before you jump into the weeds i just want to let you know and let our listeners know that if folks want like some more big picture framing thinking on housing and the challenge of housing in vermont look back on any of our interviews with maura collins she comes on every few months to talk this through with folks so um you're welcome to like pause now, go back and listen to conversations with Maura, and then we're gonna like come back to Seth and dive into the weeds. And Maura is of course a fabulous resource for all of us and does, we're lucky to have her. Um, 
so three studies. Um, and so they're not all directly related to housing, but they end up, if you stick with me for a couple of minutes here, they end up bringing us back to housing. Um, one was, a, we, we commissioned the Natural Resources Board, the Act 250 Board, if you will, um, to look at how to possibly modernize Act 250. Um, I don't use the word reform Act 250 because that tends to mean, in common parlance, take a hatchet to it. Um, I'm of the camp, I, I'm of the belief that Act 250 is a critical part of Vermont and um, is a critical uh, part of our infrastructure. Uh, but uh, modernizing is a whole different uh, ball of wax. And there's a lot of things, you know, we, we Act 50 passed 52 years ago, and in many ways, it's still being implemented the way that it was 52 years ago, and it's definitely time to, to look at that. So, and I'll come back to what the study said, and I happen to agree with the, the outcomes of these studies. I was I kept in touch with all of them all summer. I was kind of involved. Um, so there was the Active 50 study. Then there was a study um, to be done, commissioned by the, a report, uh, commissioned from the regional commissions about, uh, their, it's called future land use mapping. And the idea what is to have the regional commissions all use the same parlance and have their maps be consistent across the state. Um, and that really has implications for planning and zoning. And it has a lot of implications for Act 250 uh, because part of it is um, really deciding which resources we're gonna protect and where our town centers are and those kinds of things and getting clarity about that and then bringing that into the regulatory process as well. And then the third report was called the downtown report, the designation report. And that was done by the Department of Housing and Community Affairs uh, with a consultant. Um, and the and Emily knows this program pretty well, I think, or because uh, I think it's been in and out of her committee over the years um, with the tax credits and other things for, for to help uh, rehab housing. But the um, but the downtown program is designed at its core to bring like tax benefits for like restoring a housing and you know house in downtown, historic preservation, but also to help direct uh, state investment in a way that uh, helps uh, our communities uh, make walkable downtowns and access to services and smart streets, it's called, uh, principles, bring those to the, to our small towns. Um, and all of these programs, so went through went through the summer process. And the really amazing thing about it is, um, we every time we talk about this, we talk about the fact that the the three studies were cross-pollinated. There's, there's people who were in on more than one. Um, I talked to, for instance, the NRB uh, chair, board chair, and the consultants every two weeks all summer as did Amy Sheldon, my, my committee chair. Um, I, I had a standing call with uh, the uh, Department of uh, Housing and Community Affairs all summer long and all through the fall. And But they were all talking to us. It's not so much that they were talking to me, it's that they were talking to each other. And so, because these reports all line up and they all mesh and it's they have to mesh in order for it to work. So, um, and I haven't talked about it yet, but a large part of this, and especially as it relates to the NRB report, is resiliency. Um, mm -hmm. And so let me let's talk about the NRB report for a minute. And by the way, tell me when you want me to stop. And Emily wants to get a word well, in or whatever. Uh, I mean, now that I, generally I'm very comfortable interrupting most people most times, um, as anyone who listens to this show will attest. But um, I think it's just sort of helpful to think about how remarkably all of these different reports fed together. And as I got updates on all of them this fall um, from my planning commission or from housing folks or um, at my, you know, wherever, um, how much they all sort of map onto recovery from the flooding, as well as like, what is the regulatory infrastructure? What is the physical infrastructure? What is the planning infrastructure? What is the community yeah. infrastructure? What are all that we need in order to create the environment to build more housing? Um, because we can't just like do it on this piece by piece, patch by patch, town by town basis anymore. And okay. so I'm really excited that you were able to like dive deep into the weeds because I think each of those reports is essential. And I'm excited that we get to see them all at once. Yes. And they really, and they will all end up in one bill. 
uh, because they you almost can't do one without the other two, any one without the other two. So, the, uh, Seth, the, uh, before you go on, uh, okay, I just have um, a little question because if I was listening to this show, um, it it might my brain would trip on when you talked about the planning commissions and how all their maps might be different. I think most people would assume every, a map is a map is a map. Yeah. What was the implication or the outcome of, uh, or the consequences of maps not being the same? Like, help me understand that. They get less credibility in the regulatory process. And I think there was a want to make sure that the maps all actually did the things that as a matter of policy, we want them to do. Some mm -hmm. did, some didn't. And actually, interestingly, it was the regional commissions who came to us and, and kind of said indirectly, make us do this <laughs> last year. <laughs> that, and actually, the, the, imp the impetus for that portion of it actually came from them saying, we need to do this. We need to get them all aligned. Make us do it. Um, <laughs> and, okay. <laughs> um, so, um, so the NRB report. So when Act 50 was passed 52 years ago, there really was no planning and zoning in Vermont. And so Act 250 was really called on to do everything, include, you know, like really looking at, at within municipalities. And what we've had now is we have a lot of towns that have become a lot more sophisticated with their planning and zoning. Um, and there's a degree to which people, you know, people complain about it being duplicative uh, mm -hmm. in some instances, and there actually, there's some truth to that, and it can be duplicative. But let me, but the bigger, so the framework that emerged from this is having three tiers to Act 50. There's never been tiers before. It's always been, you know, Act 50. And so the idea is that in tier one, which, and I'll, and I'll use these terms loosely because in the end, it's going to get precise, but in your the core of your downtowns and this, in the immediately surrounding neighborhoods, um, for towns that have met certain requirements, um, they would be, Act 50 wouldn't adhere. Um, and what that could happen, and the idea is in large part to really encourage denser housing in downtowns mm -hmm. um, and um, to, to make it easier and therefore encourage it. Um, and I'll skip tier two for a moment. So that's tier one. And there's two levels to that. There's tier one A and one B, larger towns, small towns. I, I well, let me let it. me jump into that before you move to tier three. Um, you know, I think we've talked a lot on the show about how when this legislature does this reform work on zoning, um, it's often like a boat raising effort or a tide raising effort, right? And I live in Brattleboro where like, honestly, we've done everything we possibly could to r raise our own tied right we yep. have like done comprehensive planning and zoning reform in brattleboro like based on best practices and i know like you know our planning team like talks at state conferences and all that and so when like we're in the legislature talking about like making a big difference here i go back to brattleboro and i'm like yeah i know we still have a housing crisis here we're spending money on it but like we haven't done anything regulatory for it and so it's exciting to think about like that as we're doing this work in this round of legislation, yeah, yeah. be like really doing something for those communities that like are for better or for worse the housing hub in their counties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and we also um and that, that's exactly right. And um and the you're so you're talking about tier one A. Brattleboro is going to be tier one A. Right. Um, the one B as would Manchester where I live, but. Tier two might be Arlington um, for me and, uh, you know, maybe Putney for you or whatever towns are right by, by you. Um, and they would be, if they've met certain requirements within that, so those same sort of confines, they could build up to 50 units of housing without without those uh, units having to go through Act 50 again to really encourage in the smaller towns, it's focused on housing. In the larger towns, it's just uh, deregulating as we list Act 50 altogether. So it's sort of tiered. Um, Tier three, so the, the flip side of Act 250, and this is, I don't know, I don't want to expend, this This takes too much time to, to get deeply into, but tier three is the, our critical natural resources, uh, headwaters, uh, wetlands, um, mm. 
floodplains, uh, the so-called meander zones for rivers, uh, even beaver dams and beaver created. Um, and they are critical to um, our biodiversity. They're, but here's where, the, here's where we get to resiliency. Resiliency, you're not gonna stop flooding in Brattleboro or Manchester or Londonderry, which really got hit, or Ludlow, which really got hit in our areas, or Montpelier, unless you start at the mountaintop. Mm -hmm. So flood resiliency starts at the mountaintop. And this is about protecting the resources through which the water flows on the way down and done right. And what we've done is we tend to, we've, in some instances, we've, we've channeled water in a way that doesn't allow it to move. We've built culverts that are too small. Um, and we've uh, done damage to floodplains and meander zones. And so it's to really say that in areas that are that these that are designated as critical natural resources, we have enhanced active 50 protection. Um, mm -hmm. And that includes forest blocks, by the way. And this is a, this is the one that's so what um, so it's 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 those very easily I say easily identified, but those identified really critical resources. But it's also forest blocks, and to keep our forests from getting parcelized. Mm -hmm. um, a, a stunning statistic, I think, is that we, and this is from the Forest Service about Vermont, the U.S. Forest Service has quantified that we're losing the equivalent of 15,000 football fields a year of forest land to development. Vermont is still heavily forested, but we've gone from 80% not too long ago to 75% now. And as we lose forest, we are definitely setting ourselves up for more flooding. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do is when we have development in forest, to the extent it happens, we need to have Active 50 look at it and really try to get make sure that things are clustered. We're doing it intelligently. We're doing it in ways that aren't going to make uh, flooding um, flooding worse. So we have so I, I skipped over tier two, which is uh, most of the state, because in terms of land area, Mm -hmm. Tier one, even though it's critical and it's where most people live and are going to live, and we even want it more because we want vital downtowns. People living in downtowns create vital downtowns, you know, coffee shops, nightlife, you know, all the things that come with it. Um, but that plus the, if we look at the critical natural resources, you know, we're, we're still talking the, the middle, the tier two is still 75 or 80% of the state. And mm -hmm. that's where the future land use maps really come in. Because if we're really doing them right, and we're sort of quantifying what it makes sense to have where we're working not to have strip development. In fact, to to, to better pl places that we have strip development to try to try to ameliorate some of those impacts, get away from cars, make it more about walkable downtowns and those kinds of things. Um, so tier two is a little bit more business as usual, but it, but not quite because of the future land use map. So we're really bringing. How do we come to how do we come to consensus about where? tier two is uh, that's really that's that this this is going to take some time and in fact it, I, I should be clear that this year what we'll probably be able to accomplish is to really get the framework in place there'll be a lot of fleshing out over a little bit more time um but it's a bottom it's a it's a process that will happen between the regional commissions and the communities um but with some guidance in this law that hopefully we're going to get through through the statute that really sort of says what, for instance, they're called, we're calling them now transition zones as you come into a community, what they have to entail and what and what we don't want there in the longer run we want to head toward. Um, and so uh, part of the answer is the uniformity of definition. And part of it is that the, the land use maps, and again, the regional commissions actually want this, it's really interesting, um, and before they take effect would have to be approved by whatever we now call, what well, let's use the term natural resources board, that terminology may change, but the natural resources board, they would have a new job of looking at the uh, regional uh, planning maps and saying, yes, this conforms to the intent of the statute or send it back for a little more work. Um, so mm -hmm. that will, uh, Ironically, I think what it will do for the people who are, um, you know, involved, let's say the let's say the executive directors of the RPCs, it'll actually allow them to say, you know, when towns are don't want to necessarily do some of the stuff, we'll say, well, you know, we kind of have to because we're going to get this map approved. Um, we're going to have to we have to meet these criteria and we have to do it right. And so I think that that's a little bit of the answer to uh, uh, Emily's question. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you, Seth. Um, uh, anything else about that that report before I ask my question? Uh, no, I mean, I could talk. I'm happy to talk more, but you can, <laughs> you can ask a question. Emily, did you have one? Um, I have a question, but it might, it's not necessarily more important than your question, Olga. So you ask your question. <laughs> well, um, I, I find the, the tiers in, uh, that you're proposing really intriguing. Uh, but I can also, um, I wonder about them as well, because what I see that's smart about them is, you know, there will come a time when just using Wyndham County as an example, Brattleboro and Bellows Falls and some of those, you know, denser downtowns that we have in Wyndham County, just, or downtown Wilmington is another one, just won't be able to take any more housing. And there will be a point where people, either because of, you know, capacity or, or choice, will move to some of the other outlying towns. And, and so it's a good idea to start thinking ahead about what that will look like down the road. Um, the other thing I think about, though, is I think about conversations I've had with con uh, ta smaller towns lately talking about development. Like, um, I'll just use Walcott as an example, because they're working on putting in a new septic system, uh, a step uh, system that is actually pretty interesting, because their town is right up against the river. Yep. And not having septic is really starting to hold them back. Yep. And it's it's a trouble in, in flood times as well. Yep. Um, but they want to grow, yep. right? They're a town that wants to grow. And so are we putting economic limits on some of these towns going ahead with, with the tiers like this? Well, well you know I would assume that like there's... I guess I want to add my question into Olga's question because that's like Brattleboro, for instance, and I've heard this from other hub towns, like don't want to be everything for everyone, like want some of this responsibility to be borne by other communities. And so I guess I would wonder like, are, do you, are you building in mechanisms for towns to grow up basically and like enter another so, well, that's what I'm asking. I'm asking, actually, is are these mechanisms going to stop that growing up in other towns? No, yeah. they are. The, the idea is to help them grow up. Um, and so, but, but your question is astute um, because some of the reps from smaller towns, very rural Vermont, are kind of worried that doing the kinds of things we're talking about are going to like have the growth centers or the towns who are more sophisticated bigger they're going to take off and the rural vermont's going to get left behind that's mm -hmm. that's another way of saying what i think you're saying mm -hmm. and that's i know that that's a concern and it's you know it's a legitimate concern so but the, there's a couple things here is um you know it, on the one hand it doesn't make it doesn't make sense for every town to try to be the growth center you know like sunderland next door to manchester um is I, I don't want to speak for Sunderland, but I think you know they're they're kind of a housing community. Um and it's a great little community, but you know, the people that are living, they build, they work in Manchester, they work in Bennington as a, in large measure. And that's kind of okay. It makes sense. Um but so but specifically um the the part in this bill that that has the um the designation portion because it's all one remember so uh, the designation portion loosens or makes it makes much more available to smaller towns who have just met as you do more work with your town with your planning and your zoning and take go to the next levels you get more and more benefits but even from the start you're trying to make it easier to have some of the benefits of the designation program flow to smaller towns mm -hmm. uh, more easily and this does include you know, for the smaller smaller villages with the, the um the village designation which is pretty easy designation to get up to 50 units of housing without having to go through Act 250. So some of the, of course, you still have to get your A&R permit for your septic and then hopefully have a community system like the one you were, you were mentioning in, uh, was it, did you say Walcott? Is that what you were talking yeah. about? Um, um, yeah. And so the idea here, and also, uh, you know, the idea would be to have more resources for regional commissions to help the smaller towns bring themselves up step by step. But not every town's going to want to become a Broderborough or a Manchester. Um, mm -hmm. And that's 
that's just that's great. But what we do want to make sure is that to the extent that they want to move up and like have more housing, that we're making that possible for them. And and I would say Thank about, you. but by the way, just to just, and I realize this is a little bit of a controversial thing that that uh, I frankly I stuck into the bill as as my chair and I were working on it over the summer. <laughs> it's that in areas like Manchester or Brattleboro, with where you have sewer and water, and you're going to be designated as it uh, within this tier one. You must allow buildings of at least six stories, mm -hmm. and you know, of it. Uh, people go, "Oh, that's so radical, six stories." Well, you know, six stories really is no big, is not. And you know, and we've had the housing advocates come in, um, you know, Gus Selig, um, come in and say to us, you know, the way to build affordable housing is to go up mm -hmm. because it's less, ex it's you know, by by floor, it's less expensive than doing everything on a, a and you know kind of the choice is do you want to go up or do you want to go out and have sprawl yeah and right. you know and and up means more people in your but your downtowns are more vibrant <laughs> and, and also you do it right they don't they don't need cars a lot of them mm -hmm. don't need cars because it's walkable and you have access to services so seth what yes thank you are we really like it sounds like you're letting communities just say no right like no we don't want to take responsibility for housing so I know that I heard from a lot of constituents this summer who must have all been talking to each other because it was like all the same sort of. Um, yeah, yeah, I know, I know about, that. about this idea of how in California, rather than like setting base regulatory rules or anything, they say everyone needs to have a certain like percentage of housing, like new housing every year based on per capita stuff. And like, it's up to your town to figure it the hell out, excuse me, based on like whatever you want to do, ranging from like totally protectionist nativist to no regulatory rules at all, right? And anything in between. And so, so like, how does that idea that a town could be basically sort of like opting out um, of new developments fit into this? I guess a town could. Now we did say, as you recall, last year um, in areas with sewer and water, that you must allow five units up, at least a minimum of five units an acre. But in a way, you can't zone it out. Okay. Um, and so we did that last year. So to that extent, they can't opt out. And we said that when it's a four conversion of a building into four units, that counts as one for Active 50. So we did some things. Uh, that are going to encourage it kind of no matter what. But I suppose you're right. If a town really doesn't want to, and maybe that's, you know, maybe maybe it's okay because I think a lot of towns do want to. A lot of towns want vibrant downtowns and um, they want housing in their downtowns. And that's what we're trying to make easier. So at Thank the very you. least, what we've been trying, the approach the last few years and even, even, this, even this bill is less, there has been some you must, but it's been mostly how to make it easier to build in the places that we think you know, that we think as a state reflects our values. We've always been a state, uh, you know, the uh, of of uh, downtowns and rural countryside, and that's part of what this is trying to encourage. Oh, but I have I don't have a great answer for your question. A town, I guess, could do that if they really wanted to. Thanks. Um, we are out of time in this first half, so we're going to quickly. I know it goes fast. Um, yeah. So hang tight, everybody. The Montpelier Happy Hour on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro is going to hear from some underwriters, and then we will uh, come back to housing and zoning and all those fun things like that. So don't don't move. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. If you're just joining us, I am your host and producer, Olga Peters, and I'm speaking with Representative Emily Kornheiser as well as Representative Seth Bongartz from Manchester. Uh, we always always want to thank Brattleboro Community Television for sharing the video version of our podcast with media centers around Vermont and New England and want to remind folks that you can subscribe to the podcast wherever you find your podcasts. Hey Emily. Olga. What shall we remind listeners of at this time? 
Well, as a matter of fact, the views and opinions expressed here on the Montpelier Happy Hour are those of the host and the guests, respectively, and not the station, employer, nor friends of the host and guests, respectively. Why, thank you. You're welcome. So if you missed the first half of this show, we were talking about some of the housing bills uh, that Seth is working on, specifically around some modernization around Act 250. And I've been thinking about Act 250 a lot, and it's reminding me, so this is the story that I hear from a lot of people around Act 250, that it's basically designed to stop all development. That's like the big story. But I, I was thinking about that the other day because I actually grew up near the, or I grew up in the town where the infamous Act 250 visit was supposedly supposed to have happened. Uh, and the story Chimney was Hill. the governor came. Hmm? Chimney Hill, is that the name of Chimney the Hill Development in Wilmington. Um, now there's probably people in Chimney Hill right now like, ah! um, but this was back in the 70s, everybody. Things have changed. But the story is, you know, the governor came down, looked at this development and just like lost his mind. Yeah. But I think what a lot of people forget is he didn't lose his mind, at least as the old timers tell me, about the amount of housing. It wasn't the amount of housing that worried him. It was the fact that some of these houses were on foundations that were cracking or they were like right up next to each other. So if the fire department came, they couldn't actually get to the house or there was like a few houses without septic and yeah. it was just a pipe coming out the back of the house yeah. and everything just rolled down the hill. Yeah. So it was that kind of all pun intended crappy housing that yeah. <laughs> that made the governor lose his top and it Un wasn't the develop. amount or the develop. number. Yes. So I just yeah. wanted to remind people of that. The um, other thing I think that people don't remember about that time when Act 250 happened is that that was before we had federal rules and regulations on all of this. It was before the Clean Water Act. It was before Clean Air Acts. It was before, you know, super funds and like all of those things. And so since Act 250 passed, we've had a huge slew of federal laws related to this and federal planning rules related to this. So that if Act 250 entirely disappeared, there would still be a lot of hoops to jump through, but we wouldn't necessarily have the same sort of state level infrastructure for those hoops. And I think that's really important to remember too, because what is might just be considered a federal rule or reg in another state is considered Act 250 in Vermont. Thank you, yeah, Emily. Yeah. And we would, it's true that, and, and the state has become more sophisticated too. I mean, the agency of, and the agency of natural resources didn't, didn't even exist. Um, cause, uh, that, that might, might have barely existed. Phil Hoff right before Dean Davis. Dean Davis is the company you're talking about, um, who, who helped, uh, make Act 50 happen, but it really was his sense. And by the way, this, you're talking about a relatively conservative Republican, uh, governor in Dean Davis. Um, but who just saw that we were losing Vermont uh, to unplanned development and a lot of things being built in places they shouldn't be built. And it just really was. And, you know, we had the, it was the scary boom, right? Because this this was really done in large part in reaction to some of the scary development uh, of the late 60s and early 70s. And so it was designed it, um, in part to slow it down. Uh, make sure we're making intelligent decisions. And, you know, I think most people, if they really step back and think about Act 250, even though, you know, most permits end up getting granted, I think one of the things that it's done is just force people ahead of time to really think about, uh, you know, what really makes sense uh, to go where and to think about a project, think it through before putting the application in, which tends to mean that most of them end up getting approved. But, um, but I think... You know, it was it was totally well intentioned, and but you know one of the things it had to do early on because we really didn't have planning and zoning was it had to do kind of everything at the local level, the state level, and and even as towns have now become more sophisticated and been able to you know theoretically take some of this stuff on, we haven't let go of that portion of it, and mm -hmm. so this is finally 
really saying, okay, under these circumstances, within these parameters, yeah, it's time to let the towns um, make 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 their decisions and have Act 250 not be where it doesn't need to be, where it's kind of du potentially duplicative, and have it actually do better job where it needs to where it needs to do a better job. So I think that's a really this is a really good um, you know um, it's a good way to think about it. And it's good goals to have set up. Yes. So what are some of the other bills that you're working on? I went through um, just your web page on the legislative website. Uh, and folks, if you don't know this, if you go and look up a certain rep or senator, underneath their profile, you can actually find the bills that they have uh, either sponsored or co-sponsored uh, listed below them. Uh, and we'll find more information. While we're making public service announcements related to that, I also want folks to know that when you sort of get past the bills, which say for a House member would be H and whatever number, there's a whole series of things called House Concurrent Resolutions, HCRs. I encourage you not to make any assumptions about sort of who is on what for those, because essentially it's like everyone, unless you object and no one really tracks how those are going. So like, please, if there's like wild concurrent resolutions related to a rep's name, please don't think too much of it. Anyway, <laughs> back to that specific bills that he sponsored that you found on our legislative website. Yes, thank you. Um, so the two I came across on were H5, which was uh, uh, some of the studies I think we were talking about, but also H68 about removing state and municipal regulatory barriers to fair zoning and housing affordability. Um, were there any I'm forgetting or missed? Those were last year. Those were last year because those, those were early. And the one bill, um, I guess, was it H68 that um, that I introduced uh, with what I worked with over the summer a year ago um, became the basis was the foundation for what became S100 or the or the, um, or the ah, home. okay. Um, okay. I, I kept in uh, touch with uh, Keisha Ron Pinsdale uh, from the Senate all summer. And when the time came when she was getting ready to take it up on her, I said, just, she, she asked me if she could use my bill. And I said, yeah, just take, take it and plug it in, make it the basis. And that's what happened. So the irony of it was that the uh, the House bill went to the Senate and came back to the House as a Senate bill. Uh, but those <laughs> things happened and that, that, it, had, it worked out beautifully. <laughs> so I'm really, the, the reality is, this is what I'm working on. Okay. Uh, for this set, this session, because this is a huge lift. And if we can pull this off, we'll really end up, you know, doing a lot, hopefully, uh, around flood flood resiliency. Um, again, has to start at the mountaintop. We'll be making it, we'll be making investments in our downtowns in a way that really makes sense, um, encouraging housing, encouraging vibrant downtowns, and helping to um, make, make it less likely people want to develop uh, in the wrong places in the rural countryside. So, you know, if we can, if we can get this, if we can get this through, I think we will have done Vermont, a, in my view, a huge service. I think we'll be doing, and there's something in it for everybody. Um, because the, one of the, one of the things about the future land use maps, and this is a part that doesn't get talked about as much, and a little wonky here, but um, if we are really clear let me back up from this. Last year, in the bill that S and S one hundred, we had a provision called the buy right provision, and it's B Y B Y right, not B U Y right. Um, and what it says is that if your ordinance, so now we're back to zoning for a minute. If your ordinance says you can build, let's say, six units an acre, um, what happens typically or often is that somebody then comes in and proposes six units on an acre, the neighbors come out and they say, oh my God, too much, you know, there's going to be cars, going to be traffic. And, all that. and we, and so what happens is that the board whittles it down to three or four in order to keep everybody happy. Mm -hmm. The applicant finally accepts it. And what the by light provision says is no, if the ordinance says you get six, you get six. And so what it really means is you better pay attention to the time your ordinance is going into effect because that's when the real decision is going to be made. Right now, what we do, both at the local level and with Act 250, is 
in some ways we have set it up so that the regular when when the application goes in and the review process starts, we do after the fact planning. It becomes mm -hmm. and what a lot of this is about is forcing that planning to be upfront and making the decisions ahead of time. So the regulatory process is actually pretty pretty quick. Is it six? Yep, six. You got a permit, um, and that's of course simplifying things. But um, but the same is true with the future land use maps. If we can get them in place and they mean what they mean, it will mean that you better really pay attention as those maps are being put into place because they're going to carry real meaning. And that's actually good for that's good for everybody. It's good for neighbors. It's good, but it's really it's also uh, from the perspective of somebody trying to do develop housing or whatever else. If you then follow what the maps say, you're going to be you're going to be okay, and you're going to be it's going to be harder to oppose just with NIMBYism um, because those decisions were made and they had you had your chance to participate up front. So it's upfront planning rather than after the fact planning, and so that's part of what's going on here as well. I'd love to talk about that a little bit more because one thing that I hear from developers who have spent real time navigating Vermont is that it's less about the cost of um, planning a regulation and more about sort of the unknowns of planning. Yeah. And the uncertainty, that's yeah. what I hear over and Uncertainty over and it's the cost associated with uncertainty, that's the problem. It's not like everyone is perfectly happy to be regulated within, you know, nine tenths of their life. It's that the uncertainty related to that is what makes everything hard. And so I appreciate all that you're doing to sort of take some of that uncertainty out. I'm wondering how, in you, when you've had conversations with stakeholders, like how do you balance that with Vermonters like deep desire to get their fingers in everything? <laughs> get your fingers in during the process, during okay. the planning process. Um, and um, that's really what it is. It's shifting, it's shifting the focus. Um, there's still gonna be a review process. We won't be able to fix everything, but I think that anyway, I think you know, it's that notion of uh, really, really doing your planning and making your decisions up front. And I, I say, and by the way, I've, I've even used the term nimbyism and all that. I'm like an environmentalist to the soles of my feet. I mean, it's why, it's why I'm in, you know, it's one of the things that it's been my life, it's been a large portion of my life. Um, and um, but, um, but I also want, you know, that's why, that's why we're doing, I, I think what we're doing makes such sense. Dense downtowns, easier to build there, place for people to live, walkable downtowns, um, smart streets, all of that, rural countryside, and really protecting our key resources um, uh, across Vermont. And that, it, it just makes such instinctive sense to me and I hope to others. Mm -hmm. Does this, uh, the future use planning you're talking about, does that bill have a number? If people it's want all to gonna it? be in one bill. It's all okay. gonna be in, it's all gonna be in uh, 697, uh, the bill that my chair and I put together over the course of the summer and fall um, with a lot of stakeholders, a lot of, a lot of talk with a lot of people. Um, and by the way, I wanna make clear when I say a lot of stakeholders, that definitely includes everybody involved in putting together those three reports because we stayed in touch with all of them all the time but we had to get the bill moving simultaneously because if we waited till all the reports came out in december then it's too late so we we worked in and so now we're you know there's a process now of adjusting uh, because mm -hmm. the reports are all out and we're not necessarily going to do anything the reports say because we're you know we're the legislature we get to have our own but but we are but we are working to align as best we can with the really really good work underlying all three of those reports. I think they're, a, a lot of times, as uh, I'm sure Emily has talked with you about in the past, reports, you know, you have those legislative summer study committees and, you know, that was great. Let's put it on this shelf here and we'll, you know, um, and, but these My three- My desk is uh, uneven. Let's, let's even out the legs of the desk, yes. Yeah, these, yeah, <laughs> that's right. These three have legs. Great. Sometimes um, summer study is a really great opportunity to make sure that like stakeholders actually have a chance to have conversations. Yeah. Because the legislative process, we've also talked about how the legislative process or Robert's rules of order or Mason's rules or whatever it is, like, you know, you're already clear on what the question is that you're answering or what the proposal is. And so that like really deep participatory problem solving process is best done on a study committee or a summer task force. 
Olga, you were about to ask something and I totally interrupted you. I'm sorry. Um, well, one thing I was going to ask is one thing I appreciate about what you've been talking about, Seth, is looking at housing as part of a bigger environment. And like you said, what environment do we need? to be able to create housing. I think Emily and I on other shows have called it, you know, pulling multiple levers at once. Um, I'm curious, you mentioned, you know, not one bill can do everything. Are there still some places where you feel the state needs to do some work to, to help housing move along even further? Sure. Um, and Emily's uh, probably given as much thought to that question as I have. Um, but, um, you know, it's there are things like tax incentive for rehabbing houses. We did, you know, we, um, you know, there's programs like first time home, the first time homeowner program, VHIP, uh, Vermont Housing Improvement Program, um, just other things that we can do and this is the what these levers are kind of uh, things emily is involved in um a lot i think um got them involved in everything don't you yeah i know you are <laughs> <laughs> so to help uh, but to just help um you know, i have been focusing on the regulatory side of it in large measure um mm -hmm. and making it you know it's no one thing is going to cure everything like the you know all the all the things we've done in the past with the regulation and what we're trying to do now you know it's not that's not going to deal with the cost of construction materials the cost of labor right. the you know the and some of some things but it, what it will do it's one of the pieces like that certainty piece that we were talking about it's one of the key ingredients maybe it's in some ways the most fundamental agreement because it underlays everything if we can get that right, then we've at least set the stage. But you know, a lot of it's money, you know, mm -hmm. and and um, infrastructure, and um, but you know, this is this is the part. This this is the part where my this way my brain works. This is the part I really understand well enough to make a contribution. And so um, I've been focusing largely on this portion of it, knowing that there's a lot of things that have to come in along with it uh, in the long run. Thank you. Emily, what are you what are you sitting with right now? Um, I'm sitting with all those other levers. So there is like this regulatory piece is so incredibly important, making sure that there's money um, to pay for the construction of new affordable housing is really important. Making sure that Vermonters make high enough wages so that they can pay market rate so that some folks can pay for market rate housing. Making sure that folks who want to stay in their homes are able to whether that's through the kind of services that we need might need to develop mm -hmm. or expand or um, eviction protection um, funding or programs. And then also making sure we're doing the kind of planning that we need so that folks actually know about the kind of housing we need, right? So when we talked to Mora, we had a bunch of conversations about the fact that we don't have that many more Vermont people living in Vermont than we did before. We have people living in smaller households with the same size houses, right? And so right. that's not, you know, that's not zoning and regulatory, but it is planning. And right now, like very few people are taking that on as a problem to solve. Um, sort of similarly, when we talk about solving our homelessness challenges, which is aligned with our housing challenges, but not one-to-one, -one. we don't talk about sort of the spectrum from people are in emergency housing, people are in transitional housing, people are in permanent housing. Will we always have the same number of people in each of those buckets? And what happens to the emergency housing bucket when we have so many less people in it? And what does it mean to sort of develop for that? So um, what does this look like across sort of a 20 year span, right? As Seth said, we did all this great work last year. Everyone feels like we didn't do anything because all of the housing didn't pop up overnight. This is like, this is infrastructure. It takes time, right? Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to do a shout out for my new very favorite podcast in the whole world, which is called The Big Dig. It's a limited- Oh, it's awesome. Yes. Yes. From WBEV Boston that talks about 
basically like the 60 years that it took the big dig to like to go from like community participation to like a closed out bond and all of the nightmares and opportunities along the way. And so like, can we keep our eye on the ball and how do we actually have the skills or planning resources in this wild state in our two year legislative terms um, with our lack of you know, administrative leadership to like actually keep our eye on the ball and get our heads around this problem. And so that is what I am thinking about here on this dark Monday afternoon, Olga. And I'm <laughs> Thank very you. excited about the fact that Seth is like diving deep into his very important piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Now, quickly for both of you, there was a lot of attention paid to a housing, a, a tripartisan housing bill that the governor put on the table. I think we're going on two or three weeks ago now. I'm just wondering for the sake of our listeners, what is the same and or different between that bill and and um, H697? One short way to talk about it is that 697 is really trying to adhere and listen to the results of the reports. Mm, okay. Uh, and, the, and the excellent work and the hours and hours and hours of, that people put in uh, and the dedication of the people who really thoughtful people who worked on those. And uh, that's less true of the other one. Thank you. And I so, haven't asked either of you, where can we find these reports for the, the wonky ones among us who would actually like to read them? The the, uh, the NRB report is on the NRB page. Uh, okay. uh, just to be clear, Natural Resources Board. Um, uh, there's an organization, uh, there's a name for the regional commission organization. Emily, do you know it? No, but um, I do know that all legislative reports are available on the legislative report webpage. On okay, the there we go. Site. It's one of the tabs. Okay. So they're there. And then either, as Emily said, there, or for the other one, the designation uh, report is with it. You could go to the website for uh, the Department of uh, Housing and Community Affairs. But but yes, yeah, so the one the one place to go is the central clearinghouse there. Great. And for the podcast listeners, I will try to scare up those reports and link to them in the show notes. Uh, Thanks, so you Olga. can find them if you would like. You're very welcome. Uh, we have just about five minutes. What do we want to leave our listeners with? We covered a lot of regulatory ground. Seth, what um if folks want to like really follow along at home as you as your committee navigates all of this, like what's the best way for folks to stay in touch? Are you all planning like any public hearings? Um, have you already done that? Like what is um remind us what committee you're on, even? I don't know, all that stuff. Uh environment and energy. Um, so we have a we got a major portfolio because the environment is in a way everything. Um, and energy is everything from, you know, the transmission system to solar panels to wind turbines to I don't know what else um, and everything in between. So we've got a big portfolio in our committee. Um, so environment and energy, just go on our on our page and people watch us all the time. Um, and our agenda is posted, incidentally, uh, weekly, usually doesn't come out until Monday or two, maybe even Tuesday, but our agenda is there for every week. And so you can look and see when we're working on what. The reality is my committee in large measure is gonna be working on for the next, until crossover uh, mid-March, is gonna be working on this um, and the renewable, renewable energy standard, um, which is a whole nother really interesting um, thicket that you could get into at some point. Um, and then, then we'll be working on um, the, <laughs> the Act 50 resiliency piece again in the second half when the bill comes over from the Senate that's going to be working on the same stuff and we'll have to figure out how we reconcile everything. And that question you, you alluded to at one point at the beginning, and or maybe it was in the break, but I don't know how we're going to figure out how we put it all together in the end, but we will. <laughs> um, before we leave, I have one more um, question for you, Seth not necessarily housing related, but people may not know that for, I believe it was about 18 years, you were the president of um, Hildeen, which yeah. is the Lincoln family home in Manchester. Yeah. I'm curious, 
what is still memorable for you from that job? Like taking care of such a large estate and a big part of history. You know, people say what I'm going to say all the time. And sometimes you wonder how, whether it's really meant or whether it's a little bit disingenuous. I had an amazing staff. I worked with people who were so smart um, and so capable. And if what I miss, if I miss something, what I miss about it is that is the people I worked with every day. Um, but, you know, we also, and it really is we, took Kildine from being a house museum sitting on 412 acres to really being a world-class cultural heritage site with all 412 acres really part of the, of the experience in a really meaningful way. Um, you know, we two farms, uh, 